great to be here. I can't believe I've been working in the startup ecosystem for 12 years, yet this is my very first slush, and I'm loving it. So thank you so much for having me. So I'm Zoe Hewitt. I lead talent at Sequoia Capital. And I've spent the last decade working with many founders and operators in the ecosystem. I'm also a coach and a writer on navigating careers in tech. And today I want to talk to you about talent density, what it is, why you should care, how to build it, but most importantly, what three things can get in your way when you're building it. Now, over the years, I've had the privilege of partnering with many companies and seeing their company building journeys from the side. And from my observation, the path to success has many potential pitfalls along the way. Now, I think there are two requirements you need to build a legendary company. The first one is a big vision. The second is the relentless pursuit of excellence. And as we'll come on to discuss, excellence and talent density go hand in hand. Now, in the early days, founders typically have three important jobs. Build something people want, don't let the company run out of cash, and hire great people. But on this last one, it's not just about recruiting people. The best founders pay close attention to the talent and performance cycles inside their company, and they have a relentless focus on acquiring, developing, and managing top performers inside their company. Now, I like to say talent is a sport, and like most sports, it's a never-ending motion of identifying and drafting the best people to come and play for you to give you the edge in company building. The differentiator really is in how seriously you take it. Now, a couple of years ago, one measure of how well a company was doing was to look at two things, hiring velocity and their headcount growth. I don't know if any of you here remember that crazy painful hiring market of 2021. Maybe some of you still have whiplash, because I, I certainly do. But now we're entering a new paradigm of company building. Instead of growth at all costs, we're thinking about things like sustainable growth, profitability, staying lean. And from a talent point of view, we're less obsessed with headcount for headcount's sake and open recs. And we're talking more about raising the bar on talent and concepts like talent density. So what do I mean by talent density? Well, it refers to the concentration of high-performing individuals inside an organization relative to the total workforce. So in the simplest terms, we're talking about quality over quantity of talent. Now, some of you might recognize this term because it was made popular by Netflix. And they wrote a couple of books on it in 2018 and 2020. But perhaps reflective of those times, it didn't really get the interest that it deserved because people were too busy hiring and growing at all costs. However, recently, many Silicon Valley companies have started to revisit the concept, and they've started to embed it in their philosophies around people and performance. Now, talent density matters because it fosters creativity, innovation, and high performance, more so than in companies that have huge headcount. It allows companies to move faster and achieve better results. And in talent-rich companies, building cultures of excellence is easy because excellence becomes contagious. Now, on the flip side, having very low talent density can break a company. And it's a silent killer. Unlike seeing your bank balance deplete or your users start to drop, missing the bar on talent creates a slow and painful demise and gives the advantage to your competitors who are doing a better job at recruiting top talent. Now, if we look at the last cycle of technology, it's been the companies with the most durable talent modes that have been the highest performing. 
If we take the Magnificent Seven as an example group, in their heydays, each and every one of these companies had extreme talent density, and this allowed them to build world-changing products. One of the reasons that this group today represents around 30% of the S&P 500 is because they've had the chokehold on the best talent for so long. And if we look at the next wave of companies, companies like DeepMind, Uber, Stripe, Palantir, these companies too earned reputations for being the best places where top talent wanted to build their careers. And today we might look at companies like OpenAI and Anthropic who are doing just the same. They're building talent density as their competitive edge. Now, whether you're a founder, an investor, an operator, we should all care about talent density because it's an accelerant. It's an accelerant to building a legendary company, legendary investment returns, and legendary careers. But while this concept of building high talent density might seem simple enough and easy to grasp, actually putting it into practice is very difficult. And it becomes harder as you scale. In fact, once you pass 50, 75, 100 employees, controlling the levers for talent density become near impossible, unless you're invested in, in it. So today, I wanted to spend some time about the three most common traps that I see founders fall into as they seek to build talent-dense companies and some suggestions on things you can do to overcome them. So the first part of the equation is always in who you hire and how you hire. And sadly, many companies fall into the trap of recruiting without purpose. Now, recruiting is often seen as a reactive and a passive exercise. Very few companies are able to develop truly proactive, strategic, ambitious visions around hiring. And when hiring becomes an afterthought, so does talent density. Now, the symptoms of recruiting without purpose can be serious roadblocks as you build your company. And there are a few especially to look out for. The first is having a short-term outlook. So this is when recruiting is driven by today's immediate needs, the gaps in your company that are burning a hole in your mind versus building for long-term excellence. Now, one hallmark of a company that has a short-term outlook is that they solve problems by carelessly adding headcount. And over time, that creates volume creep in the number of people inside your company. And it also starts to compromise the quality bar. Now, in order to set yourself up for success, you need to pay close attention to the noise and the focus in your hiring plans. In fact, the list of people that you plan to hire should only ever really be the output of intellectually honest discussion across your teams on A, who you think you need and the value that that role or person could bring to the, the business, B, what excellent looks like in that role, and C, a commitment to finding a high performer to fill the position. Now, part of my job is to sit side by side with founders and kindly challenge them on what they think they need. And very often, the result of that discussion is that the hiring plan changes. Sometimes a role changes. Sometimes it's scaled back. Because we're raising the ambition le level on what might be possible when we hire fewer but better quality people. Now, great founders look ahead. They're always thinking one to two steps down the line about the future team that they might need to build. As a child, I was obsessed with reading onto next week's homework at school and ne next week's exam question. Don't know if anyone was like me. And I used to think it was my natural intelligence that was securing me good grades. But in reality, it was just that I was giving myself the head start and time to prepare 
And the same principle applies to recruiting. Great founders are talent scouts. And talent scouting is a long game. You should aim and aspire to meet people today who are excellent in their field or in their craft that you may not be able to hire today, but you might be able to hire them tomorrow or someone like them. Now, the next symptom of recruiting without purpose is taking too narrow a view on where the best talent comes from. Now, in the early days, most companies recruit from their local known talent pools because it's easy, they have low brand in the market, and usually they know great people. But as a company starts to scale, they need to go further afield and they need to work harder at finding the best talent. And this is especially true as you start to hire more senior professionals or more specialist roles. Now, failure to do that often hurts a company because they start to calibrate excellence to what is locally and readily available. And sometimes the best people are not on your doorstep. Now, I often talk to founders about changing up the way they recruit talent and their strategy. And I talk about this term, spears versus nets. And what I mean by that is, at some point, a company needs to diversify the sources of talent that they're tapping into. And instead of relying on an inbound flow of talent that ends up in your inbox or ends up in your pipelines, you need to work harder to develop a proactive sourcing strategy that is targeted and understands where the best talent lives today. From that, you can build a list of 10 to 15 people that you would love to talk to about the opportunity inside your company, and then pull out all of the stops to go and get conversations with those people. This targeted way of approaching recruiting yields better results. Now, outlier talent is distributed, and it's distributed across many different regions and cities and locations, and this is especially true in Europe. In fact, it's our ecosystem strength. But unless you know where and how to access talent, it's really hard to turn that into a competitive advantage. Now, proactive companies are strategically building connections, their talent brand, relationships in regions that have talent relevant for their company. Sequoia has been partnering with founders for over 50 years, and we're pretty long on this idea of talent density, so much so that we built Atlas, an interactive tool that allows founders and their hiring teams to take a meta view of talent density across Europe for engineering talent. Now, in doing the work to build Atlas, we looked at many locations and cities across Europe and we pulled out the top 24 that punched above their weight for a certain engineering specialism. We like to call these Europe's honeypots of engineering talent. And now by zooming in on one of these honeypots, you can enhance the chances of finding not just a good engineer, but a top 1% engineer. Now to give you an example, where we are right now, Helsinki, it appears in the list of 24 cities that we highlighted because it has the top outlier concentration of gaming and graphics engineers, largely thanks to the companies that were built here like Rovio and Supercell. So if you're building a gaming company, you're in the right place. Now, the last symptom of recruiting without purpose is lazy interviewing. It breaks my heart to see companies work so hard to find top performers, get them into their process, only to lose them because their interviews don't engage, let alone close top performers. Now, the challenge with interviewing is that it's a learned skill. And experience does improve outcomes over time. But if your team is low on experience, it is so worthwhile to invest in some training. Not only does this improve your decision quality, but it will also help your team learn how to sell to top performers. Now, related to decision making, one challenge I often see founders struggle with, especially, is swinging between underconfidence and overconfidence in their hiring decisions. And overconfidence can be especially dangerous 
because it creates this false assumption that you can assess talent across any and every role and function. And nobody can do that. What tends to happen is it results in costly hire, hiring mistakes because we start depending and relying on unfounded proxies for talent caliber. So for example, pedigree over real indicators that could be predictive of future performance. Again, training can help, but it's really, mindful, it's really important to be mindful of some of the biases you might have at play as you are growing your team. And lastly, references of an often overlooked step. You want to get a 360 view of the person coming into your company. And while the nominated references that you might ask candidates for as you're starting to close in on them can be valuable, it's really the back channel references from your trusted network or your trusted investors network that can be gold. That's the opportunity for you to be able to ask specific questions and receive honest answers about someone's past performance and the conditions that they need to perform at their peak inside your company. So don't skip the step. Now, an example of a company that I think has consistently recruited with purpose is Nubank, the leading fintech company in Latin America and a company that Sequoia first partnered with in 2013. Now, early on, New Bank built incredible talent density through recruiting locally and taking advantage of the local bedrock of great talent in the LATAM region. But as the company scaled, they needed to pursue maintaining that talent density. And New Bank strategically opened their European HQ in Berlin because Berlin has high concentrations of the type of engineers that they needed to build the product. Now, Nubank also built a talent acquisition team that truly cared about talent density and kept a high intentional bar as they went through hypergrowth. And now, today, Nubank is the largest independent neobank worldwide. So moving on to the second trap, and this time, it's about how companies relate to reward and performance systems. Now, in many companies, there's this false assumption that their team's performance neatly follows a bell curve distribution. And this is where you have a small number of above average performers, a small number of below average performers, and then everybody else kind of just sits somewhere in the middle. Now, the crazy thing about this model is just that. It assumes that the majority of the company sits somewhere in the average performance bucket. And not only that, it also assumes that nearly half of the company are trending towards below average performance. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that the talent is bad, but if a, if a company's talent distribution truly looks like this, it's fair to say that they are underinvested in re recruiting and retaining top exceptional talent. Now, treating your team like a bell curve can hurt talent density in two ways. Firstly, it limits high performance. By anchoring most of the company to average, it overlooks exceptionalism, and it makes outperformance seem rare. This demotivates high performers, and it suggests that the hiring bar is already quite low inside a company. Instead of amplifying excellence, this model tolerates mediocrity. And secondly, it creates inefficient reward distribution. Compensation is spread thinly across the company, and most of it goes to rewarding average. Now, this leaves a limited pool available for you to meaningfully reward your top performers. Again, they feel undervalued, underappreciated, underrecognized. Now, in reality, in high performing organizations, the dynamics more closely align with a power law distribution. Starting to see some VCs lean forward as I'm speaking your language. And here's the difference. A small group of ultra high performers disproportionately deliver outsized impact for a company. Now these people, though being the smallest population, overwhelmingly deliver the bulk of the results. Now, the closer your team is, your overall team is to the 
top part of the curve, the better talent density you have. And this is easier to optimize for when your headcount volumes are low inside your company, so in the early stages of company building. Now, the thing about this model is it has a reinforcing effect on talent density. Because the ultra high performers aren't just better performers as individuals, they elevate the entire performance of a company through collaboration and partnering with other people to push them to greatness. Now, the concept of average when your talent distribution looks like this is somewhat meaningless because there's much wider variation in the long tail. But your aim is to hire, build, and keep people towards the curve instead of extending the long tail. And this distinction is really important because it will allow you to meaningfully invest in the people that are truly driving results and outsized impact for your business. Now, high performers thrive in environments where they are recognized and rewarded for their contributions. And conversely, they are demotivated in environments where everybody's performance is treated the same. If you're not paying enough attention to the people that are actually propelling your business forward, you're likely under-recognizing them. And this risks losing them. It also risks limiting re them reaching their potential inside your company to perform at their peak. Now, to counter this, there are a few things you can do. And the first does relate to compensation. Average pay and equity attracts average talent and inspires average performance. For the people who are disproportionately delivering impact, they deserve disproportionate compensation and pay. Now, too many founders view this as an expense. But the way to think about this is it's an investment in building long-term excellence and high talent density. Now, this group of ultra-high performers are also ultra-hyper aware of their own potential, their own growth curves, and opportunity costs. So merely giving them a big pay package is not going to keep them engaged and motivated. You should find ways to motivate this group of people beyond salary. For example, mentorship, to allow that person to grow in their functional area and in leadership. In fact, you should be having open and honest conversations with this group of people frequently about their career goals and assume that you have the privilege of working with them for the prime four or five years of their career. Now, it's not just the ultra-high performers that sat at the top of the curve, it's also the nearly ultra-high performers who sit near the base of the curve because they have the highest potential to knock it up a gear. So don't forget about investing in that group too. And lastly, you should aim to continuously allocate and promote your highest performers to the most challenging projects and roles inside the company to keep them growing. Misallocation of talent not only hurts the individual, it also potentially wastes potential for the company. Now, one company in Europe that has done this from day one is Revolut. Revolut is known for its high performance culture. It's even released playbooks on it, and we, we heard from Nick earlier speaking about it also. And Revolut really leans into this philosophy that the minority of top performers deserve the highest recognition and reward. Now, even today, though Revolut has scaled, they still have pretty great talent density. And there's even a small band of employees who wear a partner title alongside their functional title. And this program was designed by Revolut to both financially and culturally recognize the people who are delivering outsized impact for the business. And as we saw yesterday, they just crossed 50 million customers. So congrats, Revolut, and uh, you're doing something right. Now, lastly, the third and final trap. Holding on to underperformers is one of the biggest threats to talent density. High performers thrive when they're surrounded by people that meet their ambition level and their standards. And so holding on to the people that aren't performing brings everybody down. Now, underperformance might relate to hiring mistakes, but it can also apply to your early team. Throughout your company building journey, you'll go through many inflection points. 
and there may come a time when you need to evolve, or perhaps a nicer term is graduate, the talent who joined you early but are just not the right people to take your company forward. Now, the hard reality in high growth businesses is that the business often outpaces the abilities of early team members. So these people that you hired early on who've helped to build the company, even though they've done a great job, they may just not have the skills and abilities to carry on the journey. And though there may be outliers inside your company who can evolve and do keep up, they are precisely that, they're outliers. Now, I really empathize with founders that find themselves in this situation. Very often, they've started the company with friends. They have close relationships with early employees. And sometimes, this even involves re-evaluating the relationship of co-founders. And it's a tough job. It requires some tough conversations. But this isn't a reason to shy away from those conversations. You owe it to your company and the high performers inside your company to have honest conversation about who is keeping up and who is not. Now, Netflix had this popular keeper test where they asked their managers, if, you were, if someone in your team was to resign, how hard would you fight to keep them? But a better version of this question might be, if the person started in the role today, how excited would I be about their potential and future trajectory inside the company? And this more proactive evaluation avoids the reactiveness of waiting until someone has reached the end of their potential to, to assess their fit. Now, it goes without saying, you should be generous and graceful to your departing employees, regardless of their tenure. Effectively graduating talent doesn't just clear the way for high performers, it also gives you an opportunity to build a strong alumni network and to strengthen your talent brand in the market, which in turn creates a magnetic effect for new high performers to join your company. Now, to recap the three main lessons here, talent density is built one intentional hire at a time, and it starts with a commitment to excellence over convenience. Recruiting without purpose is truly a race to mediocrity. To build a talent-rich team, you need to move beyond outdated performance models and truly invest in your top performers. And finally, stay honest about who is keeping up and who is not, and treat graduating employees as well as you treated them on the way in. And if you can do this consistently, you improve your chances of building high talent density, and therefore you improve your chances of building the next legendary company. Thank you.